The moon is Earth's only natural satellite, circling the planet at an average distance of roughly 239,000 miles. With a diameter of just under 2,160 miles, the cratered surface of the rocky object is one of the most recognizable objects in the sky. A single orbit of our planet takes the moon 27.3 Earth days, the same amount of time it takes for the satellite to also rotate once on its axis. As a result, half of the moon's surface perpetually faces Earth. The other half, erroneously referred to as the dark side of the moon, despite receiving the same amount of sunlight as the more familiar side, was finally seen for the first time in 1959, when the Soviet probe Luna 3 beamed back a grainy set of photographs. This tidally locked orbit is the result of Earth and the moon pulling on one another, slowing the rotation of each. Earth's rotation has similarly been affected by the braking effect of the moon's gravity, adding around 1.4 milliseconds to our day every century. At the same time, the moon is gradually inching away from our world, adding anywhere from a few millimeters to nearly 30 centimeters to its orbiting distance every year. Back when it formed some 4.5 billion years ago, the moon was 16 times closer, looming an estimated 24 times larger in the sky. It's widely accepted that the moon was formed from the debris of a collision between an infant Earth and a planet roughly the size of Mars, posthumously named Theia. Early in the solar system's formation around 4.5 billion years ago, many emerging planets and protoplanets would have had overlapping and unstable orbits that brought them within range of colliding. An impact between two similarly sized bodies could have vaporized both, leaving a mix of their molten minerals and heated gases swirling under the pull of gravity. Lighter elements and debris could have aggregated to form the moon, with denser materials from Thea settling into a core for a rejuvenated Earth to form around. Materials brought back by the Apollo missions largely support this hypothesis over other ideas, such as those that suggest the moon was captured by Earth's gravity. A reanalysis of oxygen isotopes from the lunar surface in 2020 added weight to the Thea hypothesis. Discrepancies over the precise age of the moon, varying from 4.425 billion to just over 4.5 billion years, suggest there could still be some wiggle room for an alternative explanation. One is that it formed from the vaporized remains of yet another young world, a ring of debris called a Synestia. While more than 105 robotic spacecraft have been launched to explore the moon's surface, only a dozen humans have ever set foot on our nearest neighbor in space. The last was in 1972, when the commander of the Apollo 17 mission, Gene Cernan, spent a total of 22 hours exploring the taurus Litro Valley. A significant obstacle to returning humans to lunar exploration is the inability of any government or organization to justify the cost to citizens and stakeholders. In other words, a government or well-funded space company would simply need to argue it's worth it. This was easier to do in an era of tension between superpowers, which threatened a return to global conflict. In a race to demonstrate their technological superiority, the U.S. and Soviet Russia provided each other with a reason to fund space programs. Today, without this threat, similar programs would need good reasons to argue for spending more than 100 billion U.S. dollars, an estimate calculated in 2005 on what it might be needed to restart human-focused lunar programs. Pushing the limits on human occupation of the lunar surface would also require solving several problems involving radiation, the scouring effects of electrostatically charged moon dust, and huge temperature variations. NASA's Artemis missions could return humans to lunar expeditions within the next decade, and this time we might even have the first footprints left by a woman in the lunar dust. Whether the program would be a start of a new era in space travel or simply a short-lived trip down memory lane would depend on whether they can show their value in the risk and cost of having a long-term presence on our only natural satellite. Almost a decade ago, a mission was launched that changed how humankind will view its closest neighbor for centuries to come. Ever since, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, also known as the LRO, has helped to us uncover some of the Moon's deepest secrets. LRO observations helped confirm what seismometers placed on the moon by Apollo astronauts 50 years ago first discovered. The moon, long thought to be a dead and active world, is still losing heat and, as a result, shrinking. 
As it continues to slowly cool off, the moon's crust or outer layer is shriveling like a grape turning into a raisin. The moon has lost 150 feet of width over hundreds of millions of years, scientists estimate. This shrinking, plus the stress on the moon's outer layer produced by the tugging of Earth's gravitational pull, cracks the moon's crust and leads to moonquakes. Some are fairly strong, reaching level 5 on the Richter scale used to measure earthquakes. Scientists thought the moon volcanoes had extinguished 1 billion years ago. LRO has found evidence that volcanoes likely were still erupting within the last 50 million years, a time when mammals were overtaking dinosaurs as dominant life forms on Earth. With its high-resolution cameras, LRO photographed old, hardened lava patches on the surface of the moon's near side. Then scientists determined the approximate ages of these patches by counting the numbers of craters left on them by meteoroid strikes. Fewer craters implied younger lava. Along with moonquakes, these young lava flows are hinting that the moon's interior is warmer than we thought. Other scientists have an alternative explanation for the youthful appearance of the lava patches, though. Some say they are billions of years old but were formed by foamy lava, which responds differently to meteor impacts, making the craters appear much younger. Because the moon is gravitationally locked to Earth, we only see one side of it. The LRO sees both hemispheres, and it's found that the far side has way more craters than the near side. Did the far side get smashed by more asteroids? Likely not. We see fewer craters on the side facing us because they've probably been filled in by lava from erstwhile volcanoes. The far side, though, has a much thicker crust, which may have prevented magma from spewing through the surface there, leaving a well-preserved record of asteroid bombardment for scientists to probe. LRO data has allowed scientists to construct a timeline of asteroid bombardment history on the Moon, providing insight not only into the Moon's formation, but of the entire solar system. Since the Moon doesn't have wind, storms, and plate tectonics, its craters don't get eroded as Earth's do. Using tools on LRO, scientists can count and age them. By doing so, we can look back billions of years at the mayhem of the early solar system when giant collisions were jostling planets and their satellites. One question scientists still have is how these early impacts influenced the building blocks of life that would have been stacking up on Earth and possibly elsewhere. Scientists always knew permanently shadowed craters at the Moon's poles were cold, but LRO measurements surpassed their estimates by a considerable margin. LRR's Diviner instrument, which measures heat radiating off the Moon's surface, has recorded some of the coldest temperatures on record at crater bottoms, down to minus 414.4 degrees Fahrenheit. That is about seven times as cold as the lowest temperature ever recorded on Earth. The frigid temperatures on the Moon result from the low angle of sunlight striking the surface at the poles, allowing light to skim the rims of some craters while leaving their deep interiors in a shadow. These dark craters are expected to be reservoirs of water, which is why they are a target destination for NASA's Artemis mission to the Moon. Over the last decade, LRO and other instruments have returned a pile of evidence of frozen water on the Moon. Although there are still many questions about the amount and locations of water, the substance has huge implications for the astronauts who will work on the Moon and, ultimately, on Mars. Water can be split into its components, hydrogen and oxygen, and used separately or in a new combination. Astronauts will need oxygen for breathing and to burn with the hydrogen fuel used in rocket engines. One of the biggest challenges to long-distance space travel is fuel, which is heavy and expensive to bring from Earth. So the goal is to figure out how to make it from water on the Moon. The Moon doesn't have an atmosphere. Without it, there is no wind or rain to erode the surface. That's why LRO can spot the tracks of Apollo astronauts and their rovers preserved in the regolith, or Moon soil, decades after those steps were taken. LRO's orbital path is too far away from the Moon's surface to resolve individual boot prints. Instruments on LRO helped NASA identify areas of interest on the Moon for human exploration, with the South Pole rising to the top of the list as a potential hotspot for discoveries. Since its elliptical polar orbit is closest to the Moon during passes over the South Pole, the orbiter collects more precise information about this region's topography, temperatures, and locations of frozen water than about any other region. Besides water, we've learned that the South Pole has other features that are beneficial to human exploration, such as prolonged periods of sunlight. 
More than 200 Earth days of constant illumination at the Southern Pole means ample power for solar panels on rovers and other equipment. Thanks to LRO, Super Precise Laser Altimeter, an instrument that determines elevation by shooting a laser at the surface and measuring how long it takes for the light to bounce back. Scientists have detailed maps of the shape or topography of the moon's surface. These will help NASA identify safe landing and exploration sites for commercial landers and future Artemis astronauts. The reason we have better topographic maps of the moon than of Earth is that our planet is mostly covered by oceans, and laser lights cannot penetrate them to their rocky surface. The moon's surface is constantly exposed to solar radiation, which poses a threat to astronauts. LRO has helped to identify a possible solution underground caves formed around cooling lava that eventually drained out and left them hollow. High-resolution images taken by the orbiter have shown hundreds of pits across the lunar surface, which scientists believe could be openings to an extensive network. These caves, known as lava tubes, are also found on Earth. Such caves could provide shelter to astronauts during intense radiation events, scientists say, and they could be ideal locations for collecting samples of moon soil that hasn't been altered by radiation. If you like this video, you may also be interested in this one, which talks about NASA's Artemis mission and what it may discover. Do you think NASA should build a base on the lunar surface? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below.